Well, good morning. I'm glad that you're with us today, and uh, let's get right to it. Uh, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 21. Uh, starting in verse 12, we'll read four verses from the Gospel of Matthew. And um, I always love to find our way around the passages surrounding the Passion Week and Palm Sunday as it's next week. And this is one of those uh, familiar passages that we could definitely apply to our hearts and hopefully as a result walk closer to God. So starting in verse 12 of Matthew 21. These words are written to us. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. And then verse 14 says, The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the children crying out in the temple, they were saying, Hosanna, son of David. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have perfect praise. Thanks be to God for the preservation of His Word and that we could read it today. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been going through this teaching series titled The Purity Option. And what we've been noticing is, is that God has not just an idea for how we're to walk with Him and pursue Him, But God has a way, a course, a road for us to be on in this life when it pertains to Him. And that road is marked with clarity, it's marked with peace, and it's marked definitely as we've been looking at purity. We've talked about pure vision, how to see what God has for us. We've talked about how to have pure motives, pure contribution, pure communication, pure contribution. And today, pure gratification. Now the word gratification sometimes has a negative connotation. It's usually attached to lictitious pleasures or things of an evil nature. But you may not be aware of this, but God desires for you and I to take pleasure in the things that He has for us. And the things that we have already in our lives, like family, perhaps our occupation, perhaps things that we're good at or gifted at, whatever it may be, that if we live our life a certain way and walk after God and follow Him, we could definitely find satisfaction in this life and satisfaction in things that will not damage us. And so Matthew chapter 21, we're at an interesting point in the ministry of Jesus Christ. What I wanted to do this week is I wanted to read Matthew 21, 12, and then next week on Palm Sunday we'll backfill it and we'll look at Jesus' actual entry into the holy city at the beginning of this chapter. But Matthew 21, 12 represents a very important piece of business when it comes to God. The very first activity that Jesus did after he entered the holy city on his way to the cross eventually on Good Friday, the very first thing he did was he went to the temple. And he went to the temple because there was a lot of shady, for lack of better terms, a lot of shady activity going on right inside the temple. And the first order of business of God through His Son Jesus Christ on the way to the cross was to go into that temple and to clean house. To do a little spring cleaning, if you will. Spiritual spring cleaning. Because there were activities going on in the temple that were certainly not right. Certainly not worshipful. Unhealthy. Spiritually unhealthy. In fact, it was indicative of the society. It was a microcosm of the problems that people were having at the hands of the religious leaders. So starting in verse 12, we arrive at a very important statement that's said here. Verse 12 says this. We'll pick these verses apart and then arrive at a biblical context. It says this. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. Now, Right off the top, just me reading the first part of verse 12, you already know, just if you're not even familiar with the story of the Bible, right away, temple and those who are buying and selling in the temple do not go together. 
but they were going together for these religious leaders, and they were hoodwinking people all over the place. And what was happening here was Jesus entered the temple. What, what the temple? The temple of God. The temple that's supposed to be set aside for a place where folks would come and worship God where folks would come and pray. You know, one of the reasons why you come to church is far more than, than just uh, for social gathering, although that's a part of it. Yes, you come to hear a message. You should do that every week. You come to sing songs of praise that uplift your spirits. It's a time to be encouraged. Absolutely, all of those things. One of the main reasons why you come is because you want to draw close to God. And perhaps you come a little bit early, you stay a little bit later, or in between the music. You know, you offer up a prayer to God, maybe something for your marriage, something for a child, a financial issue, a personal issue. And maybe those are not things you tell anybody, but you just tell one person and that's God. And that's appropriate, that's fine. That's what church should be. Church should not be a place where people have to cover their pockets and pocketbooks because they think they're going to get robbed. That's what was going on here, sadly enough. Folks were coming to worship God, and at this particular time in history, as we know because it's the Passion Week, this was the time when this particular region of the world was flooded with people. Their population swelled well past 2 million people during this particular time, the Passover time. And people would make a pilgrimage, and sometimes they would save every dollar they had. You know, think about a trip maybe you went on. Maybe you went to go to Italy one time, or you went to your native land sometimes, and it, it, it took you five years to save for it. And that's this type of pilgrimage for some of these people that are here. It took every little cent they had to get here. And part of coming there was that you were coming to celebrate the Passover and you would, at some point, you would offer up a lamb if you could afford to as a sacrifice for your family. And that was a part of their religious system. Now, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they knew that. And just like any um, scrupulous opportunist, they were going to try to cash in on this feast. And sure they did. It says, and Jesus entered the temple, the temple, the place where worship should be going on. But lo and behold, the first order of business of Jesus when he's in the temple, unfortunately he can't stop and offer a prayer. He's got to start kicking people out. He drove out all those who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons or doves. What in the world's going on here? Pigeons and doves and tables? You know, they haven't been going here. What's going on right now here in the temple? Well, because it was the Passover time, folks would come and they'd bring a lamb, as I just mentioned. And what these religious leaders were doing, the chief priests in particular, Annas and his son, you know, this could have been called uh, Annas and son's business here, what they would do is, is they would sell you a lamb. So say you and your family made the pilgrimage to the holy city to celebrate the Passover. You had to have a lamb. And what they would do is they would sell you a lamb. Say the lamb normally, just in, in our currency, cost $10. They would sell it for $50. Okay, what a markup. Now you might say, well, Ray, I'll be ahead of that game. Ray, why, not, why don't they just buy a lamb and bring it from home? Well... Annas and his sons, their little business, had a way around that little one. They would have to inspect your lamb. And if there was a blemish on the lamb, guess what? You couldn't use the lamb. So 10 out of 10 times, if somebody brought a lamb, they found a blemish. And then what if you said, you know what? I'll buy a lamb. I won't bring it from home. I'll buy a lamb right before I get into the temple area. That's a great idea. But guess what? They had that market covered too. They got you coming and they got you going. So then you figure, you know what? I got to buy a lamb. I, I, you know, I'm going to have to, I, I came all this way. I got to do it. And maybe you've been that way before. How many have ever been to a theme park before, right? And you go there and a pretzel's like $20. <laughs> or a soda, you know, that's, that's usually, I mean, you could buy a, a two liter bottle of Coke, you know, but, it, you know, it's $10 for a soda. I mean, it's just crazy. And it's that type of feeling that these people must have had. You know, you thought you had it bad when you went to, to Walt Disney World or something like that, or Great Adventure. How about these people here? You know, they're coming to worship at the temple here, and they're getting hoodwinked. They're paying $50 for a $10 lamb. And then, of course, if they're coming from way out of town, they had a currency issue. And some of you have probably traveled out of the country, and you know before you travel out of the country, you'll go to your bank, 
and you'll get the currency of where you're traveling from. And there's usually an exchange rate. Well, basically what they did, if you gave them $3, they only gave you back about a buck and a half. They got you coming, and they got you going. They had some routine going on over here. Look at that catch right there, I tell you. You know, sometimes I, just, sometimes I impress myself uh, uh, of how, how cool I am. You know, I really do. Anyway, back to the message. I don't want to get hit with lightning here for being prideful. I, I apologize, Lord. I'm just kidding. Uh, a biblical historian economist, whatever those are, okay, I was reading one place, and, and I did a trusted resource, and they said that Annas and his sons made approximately, again, converting it to our understanding in our currency, made approximately, by shaving off the top, about $3 million of Passover. That's an enormous amount of money during that time. So when it says Jesus drove out all those who bought and sold, there was a lot of shadiness going down. They didn't have to do that. They were making money on people's worship. They were making money. And not only were they getting the people with the fazuls, they were also getting the poor people. Because look what it says. And it says, and Jesus, he, he overturned the tables of the money changers, those who were given the false exchange for the currency, and then the seats of those who sold the pigeons and the doves. Now, who are the pigeons and the doves reserved for? Well, guess what? If you couldn't afford a lamb, don't worry. You could give a dove. They were even cheating the poor people. And that's no different today. We see that all around, don't we? We see these so-called healing ministries and these so-called word of faith healers. They actually study where a high cancer rate is and they put their program on. They study where there might be a, a lot of amputees or a lot of people with disease and they pitch their little tent there. And they take their little uneducated circus, as I like to call it, with which they try to the guise as spirituality, and they basically want you to pay so you could be healed. And what are they doing? They're preying on people's vulnerability. And my friends, I've, as a pastor, sadly enough, I've been around people with sick children who are dying, and you'll do anything for your child to be well. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't, who wouldn't fly anywhere to get whatever medicine or whatever? Who wouldn't go to somebody if they were su supposedly healing people? So all this stuff, what's going on, goes on today. People make a mockery today in the house of God. They charge you for so-called sacraments that have, aren't even a Bible. They charge you for this and they charge you for that. And they've made the house of God into, as Jesus said, a den of robbers. Not my words, Jesus' words. And there's fundraisers and gambling, everything else going on, but no true worship going on. No wonder why people don't want to go to church. No wonder why people are scared to go to church. Because they think, man, if I go, man, it's for the wrong reason. Well, sure, it was a problem, then it's a problem now. But Jesus leveled the playing field here. Look what he said. He said to them after he, he basically kicked them in the backside. See, a lot of people, you know, ever, ever see those paintings of Jesus? They make him look like a real sissy and a wimp. He was anything but that. He was a carpenter's son. He probably had blisters all over his hands. Picking up that wood, he probably had cuts in his arms. He, he, he didn't look wimpy. He was strong. And nobody was messing with him when he was in this temple driving them out because there's usually a guard here. If you study history and you study other passages of Scripture, there's a Roman guard there. Nobody's interfering. You know why? Not only is he intimidating because of his holiness, because now we have transitioned into the triumphal entry. The cross is coming. And Matthew is presenting him as the Messiah King. And when the Messiah King wants to step in and clean house, there's no Roman soldier, there's no person, not even the gates of hell can stop Christ. And that is what's taking place here in this context. And Jesus Christ stands up here and he says, It is written, My house shall be called a house of what? A house of bingo? No. A house of bazaar? No. A house of buying and selling lambs at four times the... No, my house shall be called a house of what? A house of prayer. A house of shenanigans? No. A house of charades? A house of a circus? No. A house of prayer. You know why? And I've gained this and you've probably seen this in your life. People have real needs. People are going through difficult circumstances. They need God's house to be a house of prayer. Prayer is not a program. 
It's not something that you run and hide behind because you're lazy and you don't want to do anything in church. Prayer is a necessary part of the Christian life because God knows the pressure that we feel in here. God knows that we're going crazy in here. Who's going crazy today? Look at everybody's going crazy. We're all going crazy together. That's why his house needs to be a house of prayer. Not to be a house of anything else. And Jesus starts overturning the tables. And he starts wrecking havoc on what's going on here. You know, a part of me, because I'm a, I'm a sick, vengeful Italian, okay? I'll admit it. And some of you, you may not be Italian, but you're, you like, you're a little sick too. Part of me wants to see Jesus overturn the tables of those phonies on television. You know, see them with their, their $3,000 sports get, coat get thrown on the floor or something like that. And you know what, Lord? Uh, don't, don't turn over the television yet because I want to, the camera, because I want to see it all happen. You know? And, and, you know, one of my favorite authors is Chuck Swindoll. And in his book, he did a, a story on Jesus, okay? The Greatest Life of All. Great book to get, by the way. Highly recommend it. And Chuck was talking about Jesus healing Jarius' daughter. And you remember that, that little precious girl that she was dying when Jarius came to Jesus. And as he comes to Jesus, a woman who was hemorrhaging, we're told, Dr. Luke tells us she spent all her money on doctors, but nobody can make her well. Only a doctor would tell us that she spent all her money on doctors and didn't make her well. Matthew tells us that she reaches out and she touches the cloak of Jesus and she's healed. Bleeding for 12 years, it stopped immediately. While all this is going on, Jesus makes his way to Darius' house. In those days, you would hire private mourners to come. People would play flutes and cry outside your house when somebody died. So the whole band is there. Everybody's crying and wailing. People don't even know the girl's crying and wailing. Jesus comes in and they're basically giving him a hard time. What are you doing here? And he says, she's not dead. She's asleep. And he says to her in the Greek language, as I translate it over into the English, sweetheart, little girl, get up. And she gets up. And the, the healings of Jesus are beautiful. What goes on in the house of God is nothing like you see today on the television that makes it look perverted. So Chuck Swindoll is capturing all of this in his book called the, uh, on Jesus in the chapter Ultimate Healer. And he said, I hope you don't mind me imaginatively retelling of that story, but when I turn on the television and see the mockery that some have made of divine healing, I sometimes have to remind myself that neither Jesus nor his disciples were like that. Word of faith healers cleverly couch their money-making schemes in pious-sounding theology while claiming to be instruments of God's power and grace. How insulting! Exclamation point! Okay? In reality, they prey upon those made vulnerable by the pain of illness, they have perfected the fine art of balancing hope and guilt in order to convert suffering into profit. How profoundly put. Make no mistake, it has nothing to do with compassion and everything to do with cash. He goes on to say some Christian denominations hold a particular theology that makes their members more susceptible to becoming victims of faith healers and greed. They tend to be more expressive and dramatic in their beliefs and practices. Many claim that if someone does not possess a supernatural ability often called the gift of the Spirit, he or she cannot e either cannot claim to be a Christian or not even exercise enough faith. He goes on to say this, which I have highlighted here, and it says, very good. I have a whole bunch of notes here. He says, the healings of word of faith, hucksters, I love that word, always leave you wondering why they don't heal power, paraplegics or people blind from birth or victims of cerebral palsy. Good question. I always like to raise that question. How come it's everybody who always has a, a backache or a buttocks ache or something like that, okay? Furthermore, faith healers typically give God all the credit for the healings that occur at their rallies saying they are merely conduits of God's healing power, but their humility is superficial. Their words say one thing, but their theatrics and appeals for money make it very clear that in order to receive healing, one must come to them. Curiously, they do not appear in hospital rooms healing one sick person after another. And I believe God could heal. Do you believe God can heal? Sure he can. And God is constantly, God's still in the healing business, but he's not in the let's make money on people business. God doesn't need to make money on people. 
I remember when I first started, one of the reasons people say, Ray, why are you so hard on people like this? Well, first of all, thank you for the compliment for noticing that. Second of all, it's my job to be. I remember when I first started going to church, I knew nothing of the Bible. Um, when I first started going to a church that was different than my upbringing, and I went into this one place, and besides looking for the exit door, because there was a lot of uh, hootenanny stuff going on over there. I'm cleaning it up right now for you. Um, I remember one, the, the gentleman who was leading the service got up and he said, whoever has a $100 bill, stand up right now and give it. God spoke to me. He said to give it. He sounded more like a guy at one of those bidding auctions than he did of a preacher. And I knew right away, that's not of God. That's not the business. That, and I didn't know nothing about the Bible yet. From a very early time in my walk with God, before I even knew what you called a pastor or a ministry, God gave me a discernment to call a fake a fake and to call a phony a phony. And I'm going to tell you right now, those who try to make a commission on people's vulnerability, whatever it might be, a broken home, a broken marriage, or whatever, whatever it might be, a sickness or an illness, they are not of God. They're enemies of the cross. And they're standing on the wrong side of this. Because my God and your God is a God of compassion. And my God and your God knows our pains. And he knows our afflictions. And the last thing he wants to do is turn it into a commission. And so when we talk about this, it's easy for me, it's easy for you to look at what goes on and go, get them, God, overturn their tables. That's what I want to see. But you know what happens as I begin to do that and I pull up my lazy boy and I get comfortable? You know what I get reminded of? I got tables in my own life that God needs to overturn. And... Let God deal with who he has to deal with. That's his business. And he will in time, in this life or the next. But Ray's got tables of his own. Now, don't worry, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to act crazy. I don't got anything like that. But everybody has tables in their life that need to be overturned. Everybody has things going on in their life. Because the temple represents in this context two things. The physical temple where worship is going on. But what are we called? We're, aren't we called the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit? Check this verse out. You'll find this interesting. Uh, look what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Paul says this to the Corinthian church. Or do you not know that your body is what? The temple of the what? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with the price. So glorify God in your body. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying that you are so much more than this. That your life has been set aside for this. That your body, your very body, who you are, you are to be a temple for God. This is... How, this is your temple. The church is, yes, the corporate temple, but you are a walking temple. You're a walking house of God. Isn't that appropriate? Because Christ lives in you. So if we're going to take care of the physical temple, the church, how much more should you take care of your own temple? And there are times when God has to come into my temple and your temple, our hearts, and he needs to overturn some tables. And he has to overturn them because we're a little out of control in an area. Because we might be gratifying in the wrong things. And the fact that Jesus came into this temple and he overturned these tables leads me to the first point that I want you to write down. If we're gratifying in things that are not of God, we have to realize something. This Write this principle down. Selfish gratification and God will never coexist. Will never coexist. Because when Jesus enters, when Jesus comes, at some point he will in our lives and confront us, we'll be convicted. You know, God is graceful. He'll let us, on, you know, humanly try to get it right, so to speak, to come to him and confess our heart or get it right somehow with him and ask for forgiveness. But sometimes we're so caught up in the madness of our stupidity that eventually God just says, I'm gonna, just like a parent would at some point, I guess, Eventually, a parent turns their child over to their madness and their craziness because the child has to learn from their own stupidity. We've probably all been there at least once or twice. And God gives us the opportunity. Jesus steps in here to the temple. 
And he's making a statement that selfish gratification, selfish gratification and God cannot coexist. And let that be something that you tuck in your heart. That I'm not going to live my life and pursue selfish gratification. I'm going to take pleasure in the things of God. Because eventually, not tomorrow, I don't know when, I'll have a crystal ball. I'm going to tell you right now, eventually God will come and he will overturn your tables. And here's just a little, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but it's better for you to start getting things in order before God does it for you. <laughs> because when he does it, he's going to do it. And there's nothing to be scared about. Fact of the matter is, as God loves us so much, that's why he overturns the tables. That's why he did it here. God wasn't being judgmental. He was simply doing his Messiah King work that Jesus should do. He was getting the house in order. He was cleaning the temple. And we've got to clean our heart. There are things you're doing right now that you are trying to find satisfaction in. That's just a short-term pleasure. But it's going to, to reap long-term disaster in your life. There's a path that you're on right now that you need to get off. Again, I don't know what it is. It's not my job to know what it is. It's just my job to tell you from one stupid sinner to another that we need to remember this. If there's, if there's something that we need to remember this Lent season, it's this. My selfish stupidity, my selfish gratification, and God will not coexist. And God desires so much more for me. God has willed so much more for me. And you don't need to put your tail between your legs. Uh, you don't need to run for the exit. You're in the temple of God. You're in the house of God. You're in a place that's reminding you today that God wants to forgive you. God wants to restore you. God not only wants to redeem your past, God wants to redeem the days ahead of you as long as you are willing to get on the road to pure gratification. Let me tell you how to get on that road. Three things. Number one, you're not going to like this. I just want to put that disclaimer out. I don't want no dirty looks. Nobody give me the horns. I don't believe in that anyway. Nobody wish me a stomach ache or anything. You're not going to like this. But here you go. Road to pure gratification. Ask God to overturn my tables. Ask him. Here's just a little hint. You're going to think you're cool and perfect. And you, oh, no, not me. I don't got to add nothing. Not me. My temple's fine. No, your temple's not fine. Certainly, there's something that God has to overturn. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's a pride. Oh, I know it all. Oh, the Bible's not true. Oh, it's not true. I was just teaching this yesterday at, at our seminar. I sit with people all the time. 76% of people don't believe in absolute truth. They don't believe in the, the validity of Scripture. So one time I was sitting with somebody, and I had to use the same challenge. I always start off with somebody goes, Oh, Ray, I like you, and I like the church, but I, I can't live by the Bible. It's not true. Okay, well then, who told you that? Uh, 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 the Internet? Uh, <laughs> Uh, YouTube. Okay, so we're going to believe a 16-year-old boy that puts a video on at 3 in the morning. We're going to base our faith on that. Okay, great. Great. My friends, there's so much proof outside of the Bible, extra biblical resources, that I challenge you to go study it on your own. Remember the doubting Thomas? He wasn't doubting anymore. He became an incredible instrument of God. And Thomas, a lot is revealed in Thomas' statement. Thomas didn't say, I can't believe. He said, I will not believe. Because there's not a person on the face of this earth that, that, can, that cannot stand legitimately and say, I can't believe. It's too much evidence. From birth to crucifixion to resurrection, too much evidence. It's a matter of the will. Thomas said, I will not believe. That's the issue. Because if we assume God, we assume his commandments, we assume his standards, it then could become an indictment on the way that we're living, and we don't want that. But if we're going to have real change, my friends, if we're going to try and true satisfaction, we've got to humbly ask God. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you a religion here. I'm not telling you to put money in the basket to do this. I'm telling you, in the privacy of your own heart, ask God to overturn your tables. Secondly, actively drop my burdens. You might say, Ray, where do you get that from? As you study history, you find out that the temple, especially during Passover time, was a time when people would come carrying their goods because it was a popular trade route. And it's quite possible that at this particular point in history, as God would have it, 
people who were buying and selling in other places were passing through the temple to get their worship in and they're dropping everything. They're dropping their burden. They're dropping their hoodwinking schemes as well. There are things that you're carrying right now in your life that you need to drop. Thirdly, anchor my life with prayer. Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer. That's a quotation from Isaiah 56, by the way. My house shall be a house of prayer. That's what church is to be. It's to be a place where people come with their needs, where people come to be energized by God's Holy Spirit, where people come to legitimately hear things from God's Word that work outside those doors. To hear words from God's Word that's not just mere religion, but that is food for the soul. Legitimate teachings from God's Word that are going to help you tomorrow, that are going to put you on the right course. Jesus said, my father's house shall be a house where people get legitimate care. A house of prayer. I don't know about you, but I need as much prayer as I can get in my life. And that's why I need God to overturn a lot of my tables. And I'm sure if you're honest with yourself, there are tables that need to be overturned as well. And God wants to do that. So as this is going on, Jesus clears out the temple of these folks. But while this is going on, there's an interesting group of people here who normally are not allowed in the temple. They're the people who really need to be in the temple. It says, and the blind and the lame, verse 14 is where I'm at, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. When I study the Greek language, what it's telling me, and I want to convey to you this morning, is that they weren't in the temple. Here are the people who need to be in the temple, who have legitimate needs, but they're not allowed in, but because they have problems, they're considered dirty. They're considered sinners. Isn't that how some places of worship are today? Oh, uh, don't come here. Only perfect people are allowed. Go get your confession in before you come here because you're, you're not good enough. Well, if that's the case, every church, every parish, every congregation, no, no priest or pastor or rabbi would have anybody to preach to. And, and, and we wouldn't even be here. The clergy wouldn't even be a church because none of us be perfect. But look at the hypocrisy here. So now they cleared out the hypocrites and in comes those with the legitimate needs, the blind and the lame. Now it's interesting that God chooses to introduce us to the blind and the lame here, not those with the back aches and the ear aches. People, you can't fake blindness. For those of you who are new to the Bible and have had, you know, a lot of doubts, all this healing stuff, let me just encourage you. Uh, some of you heard this already. You know what the, the, the largest amount of healings on record in the gospel are? Blindness. Why? Because you can't fake blindness. And here the blind come in, those who are lame. As we study this in the Greek language, it's not lame like they got an ankle, they twisted their ankle playing basketball in the Jerusalem PS school up the block or something. Lame is speaking of disease. They had leprosy. They had no limbs. That's the lame. Imagine that. Imagine blind people. And when Jesus would heal, it, they wouldn't shake it out and, and, and it took four weeks. He, they'd be healed instantly. Where there was no cornea, there was a cornea. Where there was no nerve endings to produce the sight, to produce the message to the brain, there was nerve endings. And where there was no limb, there was a limb. He healed them instantly. And it says, and the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. What an amazing sight. Now, when the chief priests, the same ones who Jesus is bad for their business, when they see all of this, the wonderful things going on, it says that they were upset over it, and while this is going down, there are children there. Apparently the children were in the temple. Now the children are in the temple. And this is children now. The children say, Hosanna, son of David. The children have the right belief. Better than the chief priests do. Amazing. Aren't children like that? But it says the religious leaders were angry. They were angry that people were getting help. <laughs> they were angry that people were being healed who were blind and lame. Go figure. I've diagnosed this problem, and I want you to write this last principle down in your outline as we get ready to wind things down this morning. The reason why folks have their eyes on the wrong things in life, and maybe this has been you, I know it's been me at times, is because we're too busy seeking after the wrong things. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven, didn't he? In, in the Sermon on the Mount. So let me drive this down here for you. 
Point number two, a very important point of the Lent season. Seek the heart of God more than the hand of God. I mean, that almost needs to be said every week, doesn't it? Seek the heart of God more than the hand of God. We live in a culture where it's God do for me, God do for me, God bless me, God give me this and God give me that. And then when we get what we need, we kind of check out for a while. And then when we're, in the, we're back in the valley, all of a sudden we're praying again. All of a sudden this house, house, we're a house of prayer, the whole bit. And then we're back on top of the mountain and then we go, we go AWOL again. And it's just an ongoing pattern with you and I, just how we are. But Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. And he's making a statement. You've got to seek God's heart. The blind and the lame, they didn't come in asking to be healed. They just wanted to be there to worship. What were they seeking after? They were seeking after prayer. They were seeking after God. And God met them where they were because that's what God does. God doesn't wait for you to get it together and then he comes to you. God comes to you in your sickness or in your weakness or in your illness or in the stupidity of your sin. Again, I like to think of the reason why Jesus was born in the night in a cave in a dirty feeding trough was because he's born into the dirtiness of my heart and the dirtiness of your heart. And he has to come and heal us in a way, in our own heart, in, our own way, in, in his own way. And then Jesus said this to them, verse 16. Do you not hear what these are saying? Speaking of the children. It's, om it's almost like, you ever have one of those moments when the whole, it seems like time stops and you can hear a pin drop? That's what's happening right now. Jesus is going to quote a portion of Psalm 8 and Isaiah 34. What Matthew is clearly doing now is he's presenting Jesus. This is the Messiah King. Because there's a passage in Isaiah 34 where it says that the Messiah will heal in the place of worship. He's fulfilling a prophecy right here. And as this is all going on, Jesus says this. Do you hear what these are saying? Speaking of the children. He says, have you never read? That's like a slap in the face right there to them. They've read. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have perfect praise? He says the children got it right. And aren't children like that? You know, as some of you know, last year was very difficult for Jen and I. We, we lost two babies. And it was very hard for us. And we're trusting God to bless us with another child. And we have Joseph, of course. And you always learn from children a number of different things, but especially faith. A number of times, Joseph will hear me talking with somebody. He'll come on a visit with me, and I'll pray with somebody. A lot of times, that's how the conversation ends. Not just because, oh, I, I might as well pray with somebody. I'm a pastor. i got to look spiritual. No. It's appropriate to pray when somebody's going through something. And a lot of times, my son Joseph will go, you didn't pray for the babe. And this kid will not let this prayer request go. This morning, he, uh, Gianna slept over his cousin. And he's in there, I hear him through the wall telling her, I'm saving this shirt for my baby brother. I mean, just amazing. And, you know, sometimes, that's why Jesus says we need to have faith like a child. Because what do we do as growing up? Oh, the doctor this, and this test, and that, and this happened. And that's how we are as humans. We start analyzing everything. And we suffer from the paralysis of analysis. We stress ourselves out. We don't need anybody else to do that. That's how commercials are, right? You ever see the commercial for Raid? They show about a million roaches behind your wall. I got to go get Raid. I got roaches, you know. That's how it is. We have a whole society built on anxiety and stress. Because that's what we feed on. That's, that's how we get. We're, we're not happy unless we're stressed out, it seems. We, if we're not stressed, we'll find something to be stressed out. We find something to be stressed out, you know. But children aren't like that. Children have that perfect understanding, not even questioning. Oh, pray about a baby. I'm already picking out clothes, Joseph is thinking. And just up in my office, just before the message, him and Gianna are up there. I was running my sermon past them, make sure it's okay. And there they were, the both of them, talking about a babe. And that's how children are. Children, they're not, they're not entering into the equation all the burdens of humanity. And I understand it's hard for us to have faith because we're older, we understand about money and all those things children don't. I understand all that. I don't, I'm, if you get to know me long enough, 
You know that I am a realist. I'm a conservative theologian, but I am a realist. I understand how difficult life is because of our pressures. But I will say this, Jesus, what he's saying here, what these children are saying, speaks to my heart today. Hopefully it speaks to yours. God is calling us to have a faith that seeks the heart of God. And we must think like that. We must not go backwards. We must not put our trust in anything else. And when God wants to clean house, let him clean house. And if God wants to overturn tables, let him overturn tables. Because he knows what's best for us. Because his son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross and rose from the dead. That's what this is a picture of. He would go to the cross just four days later. He would hang there for our sins. And the third day, he would fulfill prophecy and defeat death. And then 40 days from then, he would ascend to God the Father of heaven. He would sit at the right hand of God Almighty. And they are today interceding for you and I. And even a day like this, people wear green to celebrate. I, I took out one of my green polos for St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick, who died in 461, I believe, A.D., on March 17th. He is, he, historically, he's not known for bars and parades. You know, more people getting drunk today. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's crazy. Hey, you ever notice that? People just look for a reason to drink. Oh, it's St. Patrick's Day drink. Oh, oh, oh it's, uh, it's Tuesday. Let's, you know, it's, you know, people just look. It's just almost, it's almost stupidity after a while. You know, it's time to grow up. You know, any reason to drink? Oh, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick was a man who gave his life to serving God in Ireland. He was devoted to God. And all accounts show when you study history that this was somebody who understood the gospel. And his life is a celebration just of, not of somebody who's perfect, not of somebody who's a saint, because in the Bible, nobody's canonized or anything like that. But it's a reminder of what God can do through somebody who just surrenders, through somebody who goes down the course that God has for them. And so I want to leave you with this thought. As we've said today, selfish gratification and God will never coexist. Seek the heart of God more than his hand, just as these babes are saying. And wrapping this all together, throw that picture up on the screen if you don't mind. God doesn't want you to go down the wrong course. See this picture up there, if you get that on the screen? That's the picture of the front of my house when it rains heavy in the winter and it snows. Now don't, any, now, don't anybody go to my house next winter, walk there and fall and try to sue me. Because what I will do is I will play this tape in the court that you heard me talk about this and you planted yourself there. But all jokes aside, what I need to do when that happens, I need to set up a barricade. I need to put up one of these things right here. Caution. Or cadillo, whatever that is in Spanish, okay? Okay. That's Spanish. That's Spanish. That's something. I don't know what it is. They got it. Now caution tape comes in all languages. Amazing. Hey, whatever. Whatever. As long as nobody falls, right? Okay. We don't want anybody to fall. English people, Spanish, anybody. Okay. Nobody to <laughs> want nobody to fall. Okay. Caution. That means don't go there. That means don't walk down here because if you go down here, guess what? You're going to what? You're going to fall. You know what the Bible says? Pride cometh before the fall. God loves you so much that he does not want you to keep falling. All right, you fall once or twice. You got to learn from it. It's time to get up. It's time to walk on the course that God has for you. It's time to let God overturn those tables and not go turn them back up when he leaves or when things get better. It's time to adhere to God's caution and not let our selfish gratification overrule us anymore. That goes for all areas of our life. Give God all of your life, not just a little. Because if you don't and you disobey the caution time, tape and you, you rip it and you go through, guess what? You're going to fall. And God doesn't want you to fall. He doesn't want you to fall in this life. And friend, he don't want you to fall into hell either. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not fall into hell, but shall have eternal life. The great promise of Easter there is not the Cadbury eggs, the great promise of Easter, the great reminder of this whole Lenten season, the great promise of it all is that a man named Jesus, not only did he come into a temple and clean house, he went to Calvary and he hung on a cross and on the third day he rose from the dead to prevent the ultimate fall of all which was hell because he defeated death on the third day. 
so that we can place our faith in him. And my friends, I submit that to you today. Pure gratification is not found in short-term pleasures. It's not even found in some cheap version of religion as we just saw this morning. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day and we humbly, God, humbly come before you today and ask for your help in these areas. Help us to be people after your own heart. Help us to be people dedicated unto you. And help us to be people that obey the caution sign, God, when you don't want us to go down certain roads. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it has to do with sex or money. Maybe it has to do with a habit that we're in right now, God. What are you calling us to have caution on? Not because you're a killjoy, but because you love us. Because you know what will happen if we go down that slippery road. Because you know what will happen. You know what's waiting around the corner. Help us, God, to seek your heart more than your hand. Help us to seek first your kingdom of heaven. On this uh, time, God, that we begin to set our hearts towards you as Easter approaches, as we celebrate resurrection time, God, we pray that you will clean heart in our house, that you will clean heart in our church, that you will turn the tables that need to be turned, that from this day forward, March 17, 2013, will be dedicated unto you, and we trust in you to do the work. We cast upon you, God, all of our fears and our struggles and our worries and our doubts, trusting in you that the perfect peace of heaven will guard our hearts and our minds. And we commit these prayers today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.